Hello and welcome to Biber Hunter Scale Models. In this very detailed figure painting video, I want to show you how I painted these beautiful Dynamo Models figures. I hope this video is interesting and helpful and if you are curious how I got to this result, please stay tuned. These are the figures this video is all about, the US paratroopers and French civilians by Dynamo models. The figures come with some accessories and this one even has four heads with different expressions and a pipe. The figures are beautiful and very clean, but the real stars are the paratroopers. I made quite a few in the last years, but these are the most detailed and best looking to me. Look at all the nicely sculpted details like bags, equipment, belts and even knives with brass knuckles. The airborne patches are also sculpted and I was looking forward to painting them since I saw them the first time. I started with the basic stuff like removing casting residues and supports which is a common job. Because of the good quality there was no real cleanup necessary and I could start gluing the figures together using super glue. The fitting was also very good on these ones and I had no problem with assembling them. Parts like the heads were not glued but test fitted as I wanted to keep them separate for better painting. And like this the basic build was done quickly. No matter how good the figures are, there are always small gaps when gluing arms to it. So I grabbed me Tamir smooth putty, rolled it into thin noodles and pressed it into the gaps. A moistened toothpick is at least to me the best tool for placing the putty, pushing it around and to smoothen it out. When it's wet, the putty doesn't stick to it and with its shape it's perfect for filling, smoothing and removing excess putty. For better handling while painting, I always place figures and extra parts on corks or toothpicks. And for that I use the tip of my hobby knife to create a guiding hole for the drill. And then drill the holes into them using my Dremel. As resin dust is very toxic, you should really make sure to protect yourself and don't let that stuff get into your lungs. I then quickly added some additional details in the form of photo etched rifle belts. I used black PE super glue by Bergswerk, which is super strong despite the small contact areas, and glued the small details like eyelets to the belts and banded it into the approximate shape. Like always when working with photo etched parts, this is a job which requires patience and a steady hand. And with Debonda I cleaned every area where my hands weren't that steady and removed the excess. And I think taking the time and making this effort was worth it, upgrading beautiful figures to even more detail. Then came the point where I glued every part like heads, hands and equipment to toothpicks and 0.5mm wire into the feet of the figures for later placing on corks. But before that I first had to clean them in soapy water to wash off dirt and dust from working on them and grease from holding them in my fingers. And to speed up the drying time, I blew them dry with my airbrush. Now I could place them onto the corks after cutting the wire to the desired length. After making two matching holes with my tweezers, I used pliers to place them, because these wires can be very sharp edged and go easily into the skin. Then it was finally time for priming and I here used Mr. Mahogany Surfacer diluted with leveling thinner. This was applied in thin layers to not flood the figure and cover details until I was satisfied with the result. <laughs> 
And of course, all parts were primed in this step, including all heads and weapons or tools. Because the paratroopers are wearing one colored uniforms, I decided on a pre-coloring. I therefore mixed me a dark shadow tone, which was then applied over the whole figure as a base paint. I then mixed me a lighter highlight color and spread this from above in a flat angle. Like this, the lighter paint only hits the raised spots, which would be hit by light coming from above and the deeper and darker spots like folds and crevices remained in the darker shadow color. And it's always good to stop in between, turn the figure back and check the progress and if it's coming along how it's supposed to be. And this is the completed pre-coloring compared to just the dark base paint on the right. Because the civilian figures are wearing different colored clothes, I here decided on a pre-shading instead of a pre-coloring. For that I sprayed all figures in a black base paint as a shadow paint. And as a counterpart I used deck tan plus some white as a highlight color and sprayed that from above just like before on the paratroopers. But of course... This time not using a colored base coat, but a black and white pre-shading. And that's it for the airbrush stage and I could finally move on to brush painting. For adding color to the civilians I used the glazing method. I therefore mixed a drop of paint with a lot water and a drop of flow improver. For more detail check out my last video. This highly diluted mix was then applied onto the pre-shaded figure. Because the paint is that thin, there is not much happening at first, but with some patience and repeating layers, I slowly built up the effect. With the dry brush, I collected the paint, which is pooling in the folds and crevices, so it won't cover the shadowed areas. The amount of layers needed until a good coverage is achieved depends on the used paint. Lighter paints usually need more layers and after 8 to 10 layers I was satisfied with the pants and shirt of these guys. After that they were in the equal stage like the pre-colored paratroopers and I could start with refining the contrast. Now I started with redefining the shadows to achieve more contrast and for that I used a dark brown paint, diluted it with retarder and with an unloaded brush started to repaint the shadowed areas like folds and crevices. The reason why I dilute the paint with retarder is the longer working time compared to for example flow improver or water. And I can use a retarder moistened brush to blend the applicated paint into the previous layers. But no matter how, the paint should be diluted to be slightly transparent and let the previous work show through. And to get a feeling for the figure and its details, I use this paint for first outlines and seams. The good thing about this dark brown paint is it is working on almost every color. So I used it on the paratroopers and the civilians as well, using it to redefine and repaint the shadows on light earthen tones or dark green tones like this shirt. The only exceptions where I don't use dark brown would be almost white shirts like this one because I don't want it to look like dirt on this bright surface. So I went for a medium grey tone here instead. This was matching nicely for me and a bit more subtle and less dominant than a dark brown would have been. With the shadows done I then had to do the same with highlights. For that I grabbed me the base paint I used on the specific area and lightened it up with a light yellowish paint aka's buff in this case. The application was like always paint diluted with retarder, unload the brush on a paper towel to not flood the figure, 
paint it and blend it into the surface with a retarder moistened brush. And as this is a highlight paint, I applied it onto the raised and exposed areas which would be hit by light and therefore should be brighter. And this combination of light and shadow brought the first variation into the monotonous looking jumpsuits of the paratroopers. The knee and elbow pads as well as the leg bags have a green color and for this I started with base painting them in a suitable green tone. And then again the second step was adding shadows with the dark brown paint blended into the green base paint. And the lighter counterpart green lightened up with buff for adding the highlights. Like this every detail can easily and quickly be painted in an interesting and contrasting way. And because the transitions were a bit rough for my taste this time, I made two thin glazes to unify the surfaces and integrate shadows and highlights more. Of course I had to collect the pooling paint with a dry brush so nothing gets covered by paint drying in crevices. And like I said, this method can be used on every color and I treated the civilian figures in the same way. Lighten up the base paint and blend it into the surface with my blending brush. Quick and easy. Again the white shirt was the exception to the rule, as I used ivory here as a base paint and this can hardly be lightened up. So I used pure white for adding the highlights but very sparingly and a bit stronger diluted than other paints, so the shirt doesn't look too bright and clean. Another example for where I used pure white were these dungarees. After adding the highlights using light blue, they looked too clean and new to me. Being used as work pants, I wanted to add more wear and tear and as blue jeans for example get lighter with time, I used white, again very diluted and in small amounts to make the surface look more used and distressed. And after blending the white paint with my retarder brush, I liked the created effect so far, until I add some more dirt and weathering to it later. And this is the result after all these layers of paint, some to me nice looking figures with the right amount of contrast and detail in the clothes. A good and solid foundation for the following detail painting and especially the paratroopers have plenty of them to pick out with paints. The first step was to repaint all seams and outline details like pockets or straps. I here again used the dark brown paint, but this time less diluted with retarder compared to the shadow painting. With this thicker mix I went over all figures, following seams, outlining pockets and so on. And because of the retarder I could easily remove the paint if a mistake was made or the line wasn't sharp enough. And again, this paint is working on all colors and this time I even used it on the white shirt for the seams of the sleeves and buttons. The only parts where I used a lighter outlining too were the pockets on the paratroopers jumpsuits. The reason was to highlight them more from the still monotonous looking surface and make them stand out more. All other seams look fine to me just using dark paint as I don't think every small seam has to pop out and jump into the viewers eye. I base painted the boots on all civilian figures with my dark brown paint and on two of them used a warm brown tone diluted with retarder to work out the raised areas. Like this the dark brown stayed visible as a shadow paint and the raised spots got highlighted. <laughs> 
Then I lightened up the warm brown with light earth and with that painted more highlights. And the lighter the paint became, the smaller the painted areas were. And with pure light earth I set the highest highlights, like always diluting the paint with retarder. Some quick streak like blending of the highlights. And a finishing unifying glaze in a brown tone for a smooth finish. To bring some variation and don't end up with all figures wearing the same boots, I made a second version on two figures using a lighter brown after the dark brown base. I again set highlights with adding light earth to the brown tone and painted the raised areas. And after pure light earth for the final highlights and some blending again, I made a finishing glaze with a very dark, almost blackish grey to bring the boots into a darker direction. For the paratroopers reddish leather boots I applied a retarder diluted warm brown tone over a dark brown base paint. I here made sure to only paint the raised areas, letting the deeper spots and folds stay dark. Again the paint being diluted with retarder allowed the dark base paint to slightly show through. I then lightened up the warm brown with an orangish paint from a rust set and with that painted the first highlight. As usual with the paint becoming lighter, the painted areas became smaller. And with even more orangish paint added to the mix, I painted the last and final highlight. The previous layers were all still slightly wet thanks to the retarder and that helped the different tones to blend into each other and create nice and smooth transitions. And that's the result of all three versions with the Power Troopers reddish ones being my favorite. And some detail appreciation, look at the holes in the soles of the poor boy's shoes. With the civilians pretty much done, I then base painted all details on the paratroopers, starting with the deepest, like belts and straps, and worked my way up. This took me much longer than expected because of the amount of details and the different colors I wanted to use on them. And as all parts not only had to be base painted, I also had to add shadows and highlights to make them match the uniforms and look less toy-like. I finished them with glazes in different colors to smooth out transitions and bring some variation into the equipment parts like backpacks, spade bags or canteen cups. I love painting small details like these patches, especially when they are nicely sculpted like these ones. Those are the challenges I always look forward to painting and a good way to see how my brush hand is developing. The 101st Airborne is maybe one of my favorite units, as you might notice already, and I was trying to do my best to do these patches justice. Obviously in this scale it's not done without small mistakes and corrections can easily be made with the previous paint. And I hope they don't end up like ducks but screaming eagles. Not great, not terrible. Painting weapons. For the wooden parts I started with an orangish wash over a dark brown base paint. When this was dry, I grabbed me some light paint and started applying some fine brush strokes simulating wood grain. And repeated that with dark brown paint for darker grain. 
and when these were dry I made several washes with brown, reddish and orange tones to get the wood into the desired direction and make it look like an M1 Garand. Pretty similar to this pitchfork handle where I painted the grain in the same way but changed the tones of the glazes to head into a different direction for some variation. On the weapon's metal parts I wanted to try something new for me, namely painting metal parts without using metal paints or pigments. I started with a grey wash over a black base paint and then used slightly diluted grey paint to paint light reflections and worn out edges. This grey paint was then lightened up with some white paint and with that I painted some higher highlights into the grey spots. With black I made some corrections because I overdid it a bit with the grey and the painted area being too big, so I made them smaller using the black base paint slightly diluted. And that's the result of this first try. I think I like this way of painting metal parts and it definitely has potential. Of course I need more practice and paint some more pieces to get a better feeling for it. For the skin tones I split the figures in two groups to not end up with all six figures having the same tone. Each group was painted with a different base paint but the additional steps for shadows and highlights were the same. Obviously I started with base painting the skin areas and I here show the progress on a figure where I used AK's cork as a base paint. The paint was applied slightly diluted so it's not covering the facial details because it's too thick. And of course all parts like hands and arms were painted in the same way using the paints while I had them in my brush. I then mixed me a dark fleshy wash and applied it over the whole head. This is supposed to bring the skin tones into a more fleshy direction and also act as a kind of pin wash and highlight facial details like the eyes or nose. And I had to make sure to collect excess paint to not flood the face. When this was dry I mixed my first highlight and applied this onto the raised and to light exposed areas like the nose, cheeks, forehead, ears and chin. Like always the paint is diluted around 50% with retarder so I can push it around and blend it. This was followed by the second highlight which was applied onto the more exposed areas which would be even lighter than the previous highlight areas. And here I am using a dry blending brush what has a different effect than a wet blending brush and I use it more often when painting faces to integrate highlights and shadows into each other. After the highlights I mixed me a shadow tone and applied this into the deeper and darker areas where less direct light would be. The main areas where I applied it were the neck, under the chin, sides of the nose and around the eyes. Figures with helmets in their faces would also have a darker forehead. To unify the shadows and highlights I made two glazes, the first being with the lighter flat flesh what brings a slightly orange touch to the skin. To not cover the just painted details this glaze was very thin. And with cork I made the second glaze because this color what is actually from a wood set is just a to me perfect skin tone. And it brought the faces back into the right direction after the whitish highlights. Because the glazes knocked the highlights down a bit, I used my lightest highlight paint to repaint the most exposed and therefore lightest parts of the face, like the tip of the nose, the cheeks, under the eyes and the ears when free. Again this paint was highly diluted to be not too opaque. 
And as I said before, all body parts like hands, arms and legs were painted with the same paints, working shadows and highlights into the limbs. And the highest highlight paint is perfect for painting fingernails. To bring some life into this white highlight, I made a glaze with pink over the whole face. This helped not only the white highlights, but also the shadows to look a bit more flashy. But it is very important to dilute this pink paint even more, otherwise it will look very strange when it gets too pink. I then worked a red glaze into the shadows and this brought a nice rosiness to the face and made the shadows look a bit more natural. I applied it also around the eyes and the sides of the nose and under the chin. With the dark greyish blue I applied a bearded or 5 o'clock shadow and therefore I applied it onto the lower half of the face, the lower cheeks, under the chin and under the nose. This can also be applied under the eyes to create an impression of fatigue. And as a last step I applied a very thin yellow glaze onto the foreheads, which were not covered, and the upper nose back. This is supposed to create a sun-kissed skin. And that was it for the skin tones. This might look a bit overwhelming at first, but as far as I see it, this is an effort which is needed to make. Good results just take their time. I then quickly painted hairs, helmets and hats and then could finally glue the heads to the bodies. This is always a great feeling to see how what belongs together comes together after all these hours of painting. And I like to paint the eyes with the heads glued in place to get a better feeling for the viewing direction. To paint the eyes I used my tried and tested method of using oil paint which I show way more detailed in this video you can find on my channel. Basically I make a small dot with dark brown oil paint and use a thinner moistened brush for correcting the size and shape. Like most of the time I did not paint the eyes white because in this scale the brown dot is just fine from a display case viewing distance. The only figure where I did paint the eyes white was the farmer. His eyes were just too big and the dark dots looked very strange in this big space. So I made an exception here. As good as the figures are looking now, I can't let them stay in this sharp and crispy look. Especially the farmer should be dirty from working on the fields. So I grabbed me some enamel earth products and earth pigments and started with applying the enamel products in a small amount on the clothes in random dots. And then used a stiff brush to push the earth pigments into the still wet enamels to add more volume and texture to the dirt, creating a more earth like look. Removing excess pigments with a soft brush And then used a thinner moistened brush to blend the edges of the enamel smooth into the clothes. For more variation and randomness I applied the lighter enamel paint onto the leg area by speckling. And again used my blending brush to remove or correct too big or out of shape specks. On the other civilian figures I used the products way more sparingly because they are no field workers. So I concentrated the effect more onto the shoes and the lower pants areas. The paratroopers as combatants became a bit more dirty again, but not as strong as the farmer. Just a bit more than the civilians to get an impression of them being dirty from landing and fighting. Then I added glass details in form of wet effects to make the wine look wet and liquid, 
And with gluing last body parts and weapons in place, I could finally call this guys done. They actually took me way more time than I expected, but I am super happy with the result. They maybe even turned out as my best figures I painted so far. And this again was proving me right to take the time I need and don't rush a project. I will now start to build the diorama for these guys and maybe you know the scene from a well known historical photo from Normandy I want to use as an inspiration. So if you don't want to miss that, stay tuned. If you made it until here, I thank you very much for watching, I really appreciate that. And if you want to support me, please consider subscribing and liking and sharing this video. So long, thanks again, take care and stay safe.